Hey, West Side, want to tell you about week four of Life Apps. I'm Dan Sutherland, but the speaker this week is Jason Morris. You're going to remember him as the absolutely crazy you asked for it guy. Jason is also our internet campus pastor and an integral part of our worship team. He's going to be continuing the series on Life Apps, where we're discovering that following Christ, while it's never easy, it really is a simple thing if you stick to the basics. Enjoy Crazy Jason and week number four of Life Apps. What's up, Westside? How's it going? Hey, special, hey, it is awesome to be here. Special shout out to you guys at the Speedway campus watching this on the big screen and an extra special shout out to you guys on small screens all around the world right now. We got Amelia joining us from Little Rock. We got Trig from Ohio, people from DeSoto, Lansing, Overland Park, all over the place. Big old shout out to my peeps there online. This is awesome. Okay, so we are in a series called Life Apps. And Brian Phipps introduced this whole series with this concept based upon the book of James. So if you got your Bibles, go ahead and break out James right now. We'll be in chapter 3. Or if you, you know, read your Bible on your phone, bring that out right now. And I'm just saying that so that anyone else seeing you pull out your phone doesn't think you're texting or something like that. Go ahead and take all that stuff out. Brian introduced this whole concept on the book of James that God offers that heavenly wisdom that all of us need freely to everyone. Download it. Use it. And then the second week, we heard from Matt Miller, who basically taught us how important it was for us to not just hear the words, not just read the words, but to actually apply it. And then last week we heard from Casey about how we shouldn't prejudge people based upon their appearance, not even vampires. And if you missed it, download it and use it. Okay, today we're going to be in James chapter 3. And I was all pumped to do this message. And when Dan asked me, he said, hey, you want to preach? I was like, yeah, yeah this is going to be awesome. It's going to be great. He says, I have no doubt. And then he said, uh, we're going to be doing it on the book of James. I was like, great. James is an awesome book. It's very unique, actually, in the whole Bible. Because James had the unique position to watch the Christ life being played out day after day after day more than anyone else because James was Jesus' little half-brother. And so he saw things that the average guy just never gets to see. And James shows that. It's a very unique book, extremely practical. Love it. And then Dan said, okay, you've got chapter 3. And I was, great. So I crack open James chapter 3. I look at verse 1, and it says, Dear brothers and sisters, not many of you should become teachers in the church. <laughs> For we who teach will be judged more strictly. Wow. And I was reminded by the responsibility of what I have to say. Because our words at the basic primal level have the ability to guide people's hearts. They have the ability to guide people's minds and the way that they think. And James 3 kind of unpacks that kind of like the rudder of a ship. It has the, the, our words have an incredible power. And not just me. I mean, it's kind of obvious when you think of it in my particular case. You know, here I am talking, and for some reason, all of you guys are listening right now. And so, obviously, I have the power to guide your thoughts in this moment. But honestly, every single one of us have that power. Because any one of you at this moment could just, like, stand up, start yelling and screaming and saying, I don't like Jason. I'm out of here. Whatever. And, you know, now I'm putting these thoughts in your head, right? But it... You probably would have never thought of that if I didn't say that. But if, um, if that were to happen, that would be the only thing you guys would remember from today. And for you guys online right now, all the stuff that's going on in the chat, you know, all the stuff you're saying, it's totally, they get a chance to say stuff like that all the time when you guys don't, which is a lot of fun. And everything we say, and not just the words that come out of our mouth have power, but today much more than even in the time of James, which really the only way that they had to communicate was with your mouth. And if you were literate and had a little bit of money, then you could use the written word. Today, holy cow, there is a whole bunch of ways for us to communicate, right? I mean, not just talk. I mean, people don't even really talk anymore. 
Teens text 71% of the time and talk on the phone 29% of the time, according to the latest studies. We're texting, we're doing Facebook updates, we're tweeting, we're doing all these things. And it's really crazy because even businesses are starting to understand the power of words because they will pay people to monitor Facebook pages of people, to go look out on Twitter and stuff like that and make sure that people are talking right about their product or their service or whatever because our words have an extreme amount of power. And our words stick around for a long, long time. You know, like the saying goes, what happens in Vegas stays on your friend's Facebook page forever. <laughs> Here's what I want you to know. Number one, our words have power. Which is precisely why when I was growing up, my parents constantly told me, watch what you say. <laughs> and they understood this very well. In fact, they used this uh, particular passage of Scripture that said in Matthew that every one of us will give an account for every idle word that we speak, every single one, which is kind of crazy. And in, in my house, there were all kinds of taboos of things that we couldn't say. Like, you know, for most households, you know, they're like certain words are taboo. Like I couldn't you know, of course, I couldn't cuss or anything like that, but we even went a step further than that in our particular household going up because I wasn't even allowed to say euphemisms. And what that means is I wasn't allowed to say darn because it sounded too much like a cuss word, the other one that starts with D. You know what I'm saying? I wasn't allowed to say, oh my gosh, because that sounded like taking the Lord's name in vain. And if I were to actually take the Lord's name in vain, for example, I would get my tongue scrubbed with not just any soap, lava hand soap. <laughs> so I could be, I could have that little extra reminder of that volcanic fire and brimstone in my mouth. <laughs> and if perchance, I copped an attitude to my mom or I was too whiny or complainy or decided to, to just have an attitude with my mouth and to talk back, I got my mouth filled with joy. <laughs> Liquid dish soap. That's the way I grew up. <laughs> and you would think that with all that stuff that happened in my household, that those were the things that I remembered the most about things that I said that affected other people. But it really wasn't that way. The things that I remember the most about my childhood are the things that people said to me, whether that be good or bad. And if you stop and think about it, probably when you think of your childhood and the, the way that you grew up, or even lately, the things that affect you the most are the things that people say to you or say about you. And it doesn't even have to be true. Isn't it weird? how that affects us so much? Isn't it weird how we can stay up at night sometime with our head on the pillow and think to ourselves, why did she say that? Why does he think that? It is the power of words. Proverbs, the brother to the book of James in the Old Testament, Proverbs 8, 18, 21 says, the tongue can bring death or life. Those who love to talk will reap the consequences, whether that be good or bad. Reap the good consequences, reap the bad consequences. And James mirrors that same sentiment in James chapter 3, verses 9 and 10. It says, out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. What James is saying, what Proverbs is saying here, you have an incredible power right there in the words that you speak. They can be for good they can be for bad. They can be for cursing. They can be for blessing. They can be for life or they can be for death. It depends on you. It depends on how you use it. Now, there's been a ton of things where I can look back on my childhood and I can think of ways that people have marked me in a good way by the things that they've said. I can remember one particular time when I was 11 years old, and we were almost every weekend at that age, I was working in our church. You know, we were doing construction and that sort of thing. And my job that day 
was to sweep the entire auditorium. And there was sawdust and, you know, boards all over the place. It was my job to sweep the entire auditorium about this size so they could lay carpet the following week. And I started on that hot summer day with no air conditioning. We all know what that feels like these days, right? Hot summer day, no air conditioning, sweeping up. It it took me all day long to do that. At the end of the day, it was around 4 o'clock, I was just wet, broom in hand. It was basically all done. My dad walks in from working in another part of the building. He walks in, and he looks around, and he says, wow, Jason, I am so proud of you. That affects me right here to this day. I'm so proud of you. You are a hard worker. You worked at this all day long. Nobody told you to keep on doing it. You just did it. Let's go to Dairy Queen. You can just get whatever you want. (laughs) And I got the biggest cherry, Mr. Freeze. You know, they don't even sell those things anymore because they are so dangerously, painfully cold. (laughs) My sister fainted twice drinking one of those things. (laughs) I am not lying, okay? They are colder than ices. They're amazing on a, on a hot summer day. Best thing ever. But more than the Mr. Freeze, I'm telling you, what my dad said to me changed me. It marked me. And I would love to say that the only things that I remember about my junior high days were the things that people said that were nice to me. But that's just not the truth. In fact, there was this one girl in the sixth grade Her name was Joy Stevens, which is kind of nuts that I even remember her name because I don't even remember the girl's names that I had a crush on in sixth grade, okay? But this girl, I remember. And the reason why was because she teased me incessantly. And she she used this particular phrase to describe me because she knew that it bugged me so much. She called me a pansy. She called me a pansy because I like Pac-Man more than baseball and because I didn't wear cowboy boots like her big brother did. Drove me nuts. And, you know, like growing up, my parents, you know, if you can't say anything nice, don't say anything at all. You know, just shut your mouth, take it. And one particular day, she was sitting behind me in the school bus and she called me a pansy and something just snapped. Something happened that had never happened before, and by the grace of God, has never happened since. I punched a girl. (laughs) Now, we're not talking about a friendly fist bump, a little slap on the face. No. We're talking about a white knuckle, throw your hip into it, don't care if I break my hand, fist of fury. Okay? Okay. She was wearing a yellow sleeveless sundress that day. I remember all these things. And when I lit into her shoulder with everything that I had, there was this, you know how it is when kids get hurt? And there's like this little parenthesis of time where they're just in shock before they start screaming bloody murder. You know what I'm saying? In that parenthesis of time, For some weird reason, I had the presence of mind in the sixth grade to get up into her grill and say, would a darn pansy do that? (laughs) Half an hour later, I was in the principal's office wondering what had just happened. (laughs) I learned something very important that day, something that I continue to learn and that I am beginning to I think, understand, especially this past month after looking at this particular passage of Scripture. And here's what it is. Number two, editing isn't enough. James 3.8 says, no one can tame the tongue. And there's a reason for that. It's because sooner or later, you're going to have issues if all you do is edit the things you say, if all you do is filter what's coming out of your mouth. There's two main problems with doing that, with just monitoring, only monitoring what you say. Is one, and I figured this out in the sixth grade, eventually it fails. Eventually, somebody is going to push your button. 
eventually you're going to have a bad day. You're going to be frustrated. You're going to be weak. You're going to be tired. Whatever that seems like. Your hormones may be out of whack. Whatever. One day, you're going to lose it. And most of the time, you will probably lose it on the people that are around you the most. And unfortunately, the people that are around you the most are the people that you also love the most, most of the time. <laughs> Filters are great. You can go through life and just monitor what you say. But they only go so far. Wouldn't it be nice to take back some of those hurtful things that you said in those moments? Wouldn't it be nice to reach into that outbox and unsend that email? Wouldn't it be nice to untweet that tweet that you did? I know there's a couple of U.S. senators that are, would love to be able to do that right now. <laughs> you might be able to keep things that you shouldn't say from happening most of the time. But honestly... Your heart is like, it's, it's kind of like sneezing. You know, this pressure builds up and eventually you let it out and it feels great in the moment, but then you got to clean up the mess. <laughs> Second problem with only monitoring what you say, and that is that silence doesn't build up anyone. You need to understand some. This is something that actually I am beginning to understand just this month. And this is the part that is honestly wrecking me inside. Just because you're not cursing doesn't mean you're blessing. Did you catch that? Just because you're not cursing doesn't mean you're blessing. Sometimes when all you do, when you monitor what you say, if you can't say anything nice, don't say anything at all, really the only thing that you're able to add to the conversation is silence. And that's it. Nobody gets built up with silence. Marriages don't come back together through silence. Relationships don't get fixed through silence. Your kids aren't going to feel better about themselves through silence. It doesn't work. And I know that there are times that you need to keep your mouth shut. I get that. But we shouldn't just stop there. Because honestly, a lot of our relationships feel like an emotional minefield. You know what I'm talking about when you have these conversations, especially with family, where you hit a certain topic and it blows up in your face. And it's like, okay, we won't talk about that anymore, right? Or maybe you're in a marriage that feels this way. Okay, and then now we're not going to talk about this anymore. A couple years later, now we're, gonna we're not going to talk about that anymore. And after a while, the only thing that happens in your relationship is just silence because it feels like an emotional minefield. You feel like you can't go anywhere. So here is how we fix it. And this is the big idea for the message. Number three, when it comes to your words, don't just zip it, flip it. You don't just need to stop saying those negative things. And here's some examples of the negative stuff, the cursing that we hear a lot. If I have to go to another meeting, I'm gonna shoot myself. I do all the work around here. We are never going to get out of debt. These gas prices are out of control. This place is such a pigsty. It is so hot, my brain is boiling inside my skull. And stuff like this can come out of our mouth. It can come out on a blog post. It can come out on a Facebook comment. It can come out in an email, a text, whatever it, it is. Our words end up being pretty negative most of the time. In fact... There was a study done by the Gottman group that there is a ratio. For every one comment of encouragement, there are six comments of criticism. So what you need to flip is flip your ratio. Flip your ratio. When you hear that statistic, to me, when I hear it, honestly, that explains a lot. That explains a lot about our toxic workplaces that end up having this big old moan zone around the water cooler that are filled with this negativity, slander, complaining, gossip, secret, cynicism, pessimism. It actually explains a lot about our failing marriages. In fact, there was another study done by the U.S. News and World Report 
that studied the way that couples talk to one another. And they found that when the ratio of negative comments was not six to one, but 10 to one to the comments of encouragement, 90% of those relationships, 90% of those marriages failed within the first five years. They could almost predict which marriages were going to make it or not based upon the way that they just talked to one another. You need to flip your ratio. Because honestly, if you just want to mess up your marriage, all you got to do is talk about how your spouse doesn't look the way they used to or how they don't act the way they used to. Or you can criticize the way they drive or how they leave clothes around the house. I mean, there's all kinds of different things that we could do, right? And if perchance you happen to hear, whether it be from your spouse or from your kids, your employees or other people in the workplace, if you hear this phrase, I just can't seem to do anything right in your eyes, that is a big red flag that your ratio is out of whack and you have to flip your ratio. Because honestly, life is too short to be negative. And the Bible says that our speech should be full of grace and seasoned with just a little bit of salt, just a little bit of constructive criticism. When what's typical of people that communicate with one another, especially in our culture right now, I have no idea why. Only in America can you have dozens of reality shows where people just criticize other people trying to do stuff. You know, honestly. Ephesians 4.29 says that no rotten talk should come from your mouth, but only what is good for the building up of someone in need in order to give grace to those who hear. What needs to happen is that you need to unleash the power of encouragement, even if they call you crazy. And honestly, for me, people ask me often, Jason, why are you so amped up all the time? Why are you so enthusiastic all the time? Why are you so happy all the time? Whether it be inside the church or outside of the church, it's really kind of odd because I don't consider myself to be crazy. <laughs> Here's what I do believe, though. And maybe this is what is unique. I believe in Jesus. And I had the opportunity to one-up James. James was the half-brother of Jesus, according to God and according to Scripture, I'm Jesus' brother. I get to be co-heir with Jesus. Worst case scenario, I don't care how hot it gets, I don't care what happens out here, worst case scenario, I'm going to heaven. And in the end, me and Jesus, we win. <laughs> how could I not be positive about that? Honestly, I think that we have the power to become the most positive people on the planet. Maybe that's tough for you to do. Maybe it is a little hard for you to be that positive. And I think what probably needs to happen is not that you need to flip your ratio, because you already know that's out of whack. You need to flip your focus. Because most of the time, we feel that our personal happiness or our lack of being able to be positive is dependent upon what happens outside of us rather than what happens inside of us. You need to analyze who you're talking to because it's not that you can't control your mouth when you're talking to that teenage kid who can't seem to navigate the parking lot a vehicular constipation that is I-35 North right now. The problem goes much deeper than that. The problem is not your boss, where you would never say to his face what you're feeling, but you'll share it with everyone around the water cooler. And it's probably not, it's probably much deeper than that. It's not just that you can't have a face-to-face -face conversation with the manager of that particular business or whatever, you feel the need to publicize how bad and how mad you are to everybody out on the internet via Twitter. The problem is probably a little bit deeper than that. 
whether that be a Facebook comment, whether it be a comment card, or whatever that happens to be, you need to listen to the things that are happening on the inside. For example, if you find yourself biting your tongue a lot, where you feel like you can't really say a whole lot because of all of the stuff that you've got inside, you find yourself screaming at your spouse on the inside and having these imaginary conversations in the shower with your boss. You know what I'm talking about? That's where I got stuck. And that's where this particular part of James begins to wreck me. Because I felt that I was morally superior by not cursing. I felt like I was morally superior by not saying mean things and looking down at others who did when in all actuality what was going on on the inside was just as bad, if not worse, because I was proud about not having said it. And your heart, honestly, is like a tube of toothpaste. When it gets under pressure, what's inside is going to come out the mouth. Matthew 12, 34 says, For whatever is in your heart determines what you say. So what needs to really happen here, flip your ratio, flip your focus, not from the outside, but flip it to the inside. And you might find out that what you really need is a change of heart. You might find out, like I did this past month, that what I needed was for God to clean what was on the inside of me. Now, here's what I'm not saying, guys. I'm not saying that what you need to do is just stop trashing your, your ex, all right? What I'm saying is, and this is what James is saying, you need to love your ex. You need to forgive your ex to the point that your heart can be free from that pain. We're not talking about here about you just not griping and complaining about our elected officials right now, which, by the way, we've all collectively put into office but to honestly pray for them and to heal that rebellious heart that we have inside because they are making some really tough decisions right now and pray for them because they need it. The key to controlling your tongue is cleaning up the content of your heart. So some of you need to flip your talk. Wouldn't it be cool if criticism were the aberration? Wouldn't it be nice if you could imagine the power that you could wield in the workplace through your words of encouragement, think about how your relationships, what they would look like, what they would feel like if you had six words of encouragement for every constructive criticism. And if perchance someone did talk to you about that criticism, that it was to build you up, wouldn't that be cool? Wouldn't it be nice if we felt the same urgency that we do to criticize, if we felt that same urgency or more to encourage, wouldn't it be cool if the phrase, we need to talk, would be about something good? <laughs> wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> and even if you did have to say something negative, that you had six positive things to say alongside of it, because encouragement, and get this, encouragement is never, never a small thing when you're on the receiving end. And you have that power. And if perchance opening your mouth requires, requires an inordinate amount of discipline, you need to flip your focus, check your heart. And honestly, next week, we're going to be talking exactly about that. I don't have time to unpack everything about that heart change, but that is precisely what James is going to be talking about next week. I think it's appropriate for us to talk to the boss right now. Let's pray. God, right now, help us to understand the power of our words. Let us leave a legacy of people that have rubbed shoulders with us that can remember specific times of encouragement, specific times where we built them up. Let that be our legacy, Father. And God, help us to not just zip it, but flip it, to flip our ratio of encouragement to criticism, 
flip our focus from thinking that it's all about everything that's happening around me to what's happening inside me. And God, if we need that heart change, make that change happen within us. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord. Let that be our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen.